I'm Brandon Knight, and this is My Seminary Life. Every week, almost every single week of this series, you people have had to listen to me say something to the effect of, I'm a bad theologian and don't really care about where this conversation is headed. Because, which is a uh, kind of a horrible thing to say, but it's because a lot of times we have dealt with topics that we can get really muddled down in and maybe lose the focus of the passage, maybe lose the uh, the greater intention. Uh, case in point would be the episode Kenosis Theory, which, based off of the streams, y'all have found that episode really interesting. But we can get bogged down, muddled down in some of these theological debates. For example, like the topic of the sons of God in Genesis 6, verse 2. But you know what's funny? the funny thing about this one? It's actually like, my favorite of the endless debating episodes, endless debating conversations. So you know what? I'm here for it today. Let's talk about the sons of God in Genesis 6-2. Again, I'm Brandon Knight. Welcome back to another episode of My Seminary Life. If you're checking us out for the very first time, welcome. Glad you chose to stop by for an episode. We are almost done with Theology Seminar 1, Systematic Theology 1. Over the past several weeks, we've talked about uh, different parts of Christology, the Trinity, the we had the Holy Spirit last week, and this week, the focus was all on angels. And specifically, our homework, our positional paper, focused on this phrase, the sons of God in Genesis 6-2. And that's what we're going to talk about today and how it is relevant to us and some other insights I have for us today from that passage. But before we dive into today's topic, I just wanted to let you all know that it is official. Systematic Geekology is live. Systematic Geekology is a faith-based geek podcast and multimedia event that I uh, am a part of now. They are. You can find the show wherever podcasts are streamed on. You can also find the show on Facebook and Instagram at Systematic Ecology. Please go check it out. It's a lot of fun. So far, we have a plethora of episodes. I'm on one about why Christians love the Lord of the Rings and hate Harry Potter. There's a fascinating discussion about reincarnation in light of Avatar The Last Airbender, why Christians have an issue with anime and D&D. It's all over the place. Check it out. And make sure you're also following us on in, on social media, uh, especially be checking us out on Saturdays because that's my day to post. So check out uh, my rotating content. Also, you can find the links on Sundays on My Seminary Life Facebook and Instagram page. I'll be highlighting the different posts and links to episodes on Sundays on our Facebook page and Instagram. Um, and I think that's... Oh, and check out patreon.com slash systematic ecology for other fun exclusive content. We just recorded our first bonus episode after show on uh, Doctor Who Season 2, Episodes 8 and 9 which is the one where the doctor fights Satan, if you recall. And also check out our website. There is a blog section, which I'm very excited for. I've already written one blog post for that area on my opinion on who is the best classic horror director. Uh, as many of you who know me know that uh, at heart... I am a. I, I want to be a writer at heart. I, I'm a writer. I love podcasting and I love preaching and teaching, but I, I want to write. So I'm excited for this opportunity to flex some of my writing muscles as well. So all that to say, please go check them out. It's uh, it's it's a part of my it's a part of my life now. I'm excited for it and uh, yeah. So thanks for checking it out if you have already. Now back to the show. The sons of God. Let's go ahead and just read, just so that way we're all on the same page. Let's start off by reading Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. So here we go. 
When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, and sons of God saw that, I have to turn the page, saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives, and they as they as many as they chose. When the Lord then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, and men of renown. So, this is what <laughs> I had to write about this week. What does this have to do with angels? Might be your initial first thought. Is what does this have to do with a discussion on angels? And the thing is, it's this term, sons of God. This is how you interpret that phrase affects the enti- that entire group of verses and then also crosses over into the discussion on angelology. Now, there are three scholarly primary views on who the sons of God are in this verse. There are, in my studying, I came across two additional theories of who the sons of God are in this verse. Uh, I will also discuss those two as well, uh, but we're going to primarily focus on these three main scholarly views first and foremost, okay? So, In light of the rest of the Old Testament, whenever the phrase sons of God is used, it refers to angels. It refers to angels. And in Job 1, I think it's verses 6 and 7, uh, you can see that clearly where the sons of God, including Satan, appear before God. And it's uh, interpreted as angels are appearing before God and Satan being a fallen angel. And so the first most popular and longest standing tradition interpretation of these verses is that angels, or more specifically fallen angels, because that's what the term Nephilim is, is uh, fallen. Fallen angels have had relations with human women. I should have said this about six minutes ago. I I would like to now say uh, listener discretion is advised because if that hasn't given you the hint, we're going to talk about some kind of weird and maybe uncomfortable things in this episode that littler ears, it's your judgment call. If you're a parent listening to this and you have littler kids, it's your judgment call if you want them to hear about demons having sex with humans. Okay, that's just going to say it now. All right, so popular view number one is that fallen angels have had intercourse with human women. And the result are this mighty men, this race of half human, half supernatural species is now upon the earth during and apparently also possibly afterwards the days of Noah. Now that sounds utterly ridiculous and crazy, but the thing is, again, all throughout the Old Testament, the phrase sons of God are translated as angels. And when you get into the New Testament, you have verses like Job verses 6 and 7, I believe. Let me check my notes. Job verse, or not Job, excuse me, Jude verses 6 and 7, and also 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5, that talks about God judging angels for sinning, and that sin seems to be connected to something sexual in nature. So, in the broader scope of scriptures, you have this idea that there are angels who have sinned sexually. So, fallen angels have sinned sexually. And like I said, not only is this seem to have strong biblical support, there's actually a strong historical support as well. Not just within Christianity, 
but within Judaism as well. This is a long-standing interpretation and belief. It goes all the way back to Judaism. In the book of Enoch, there is a recording of this story, and it very explicitly states they were fallen angels having sex with humans, and the result was this super species. Again, oh, actually, I don't know if we talked about this. In the episode on what is the Bible, we talked a lot about how the canon of Scripture brought together and the books of the Apocrypha, but I don't remember if we talked at all about the Pseudepigrapha. So the Pseudepigrapha is a group of writings who the authors claim to be biblical characters, but they are not. And oftentimes they are full of theology errors. The book of Enoch is part of this group of writings. We don't believe that Enoch actually wrote these wrote this book. Other books that would be a part of this would be anything related to the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas Iscariot. They would be a part of the Pseudepigrapha. So technically, this is part of a group of literature that we usually dismiss as the church. However, it is somewhat embraced within Judaism, at least a long time ago, as kind of like this historical background type of literature. It also shows up in rabbinical literature. It also was the views held by Philo and Josephus, who are both uh, ancient Judaism, ancient Jewish scholars who wrote some of the original history texts, and also Tyrillian, one of the church fathers, this was the view that he held. Now, what is important to point out here is that just because something is accepted as a traditional view does not necessarily equate truth, okay? There have been plenty of times throughout the history of the church, and also Judaism, where views and doctrines have been held but a larger look at scripture dismisses that view. The difficult part about this situation is that when you look at the rest of scripture, there actually seems to be biblical support for view number one, demons had sex with humans, and the result was a superhuman race. Okay, view number two. View number two takes the term sons of God and uses it as a title to refer to the line of Seth and the daughters of man as a term for a title for the women who were born out of the line of Cain. So if you recall back in Genesis four, four and five, I think. um, So right before this section, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel. God puts like this curse on him. Adam and Eve have another have another son. His name is Seth. And centuries from now, at least at that point, Jesus would be born of this line. And the line of Cain kind of becomes like one of the main antagonists within the Jewish uh, narrative throughout the Old Testament. All that to say then that it would be viewed that the line of Seth is the God-fearing, godly line, and the line of Cain is the unbeliever's line. So, in the first, in the first view, the sin that is committed is an interspecies sex, which is condemned in Scripture and gross. It's like OG alien film. In this view, the sin that is being committed is an intermingling of believers and non-believers in a marital relationship, which is also condemned throughout Scripture. It comes up in the Pentateuch. It comes up at the end of the book of Ezra as a main issue. It Paul writes about it in the epistles, not to be unequally yoked. So there is a sin that is going on here. That is condemned in the rest of Scripture. And the biggest support for this view that is contrary to the first view is that in Matthew 20... I gotta find it now. 
Matthew 22, 30. Jesus is talking about the resurrection to his disciples, and he says that in the resurrection, we will be like the angels who are not given into marriage. So, scholars and people who hold to this view have taken this verse to mean that, see, angels don't have a desire to be in marriage, and possibly, we don't know this for a fact, but possibly don't have a reproduction system in place anyway. Even though you have examples of Michael or Gabriel who are identified in masculine ways in the scriptures, that doesn't necessarily mean that they had masculine body parts all over. Make sense? So, view one, demons had sex with humans. View two... It is an intermingling of the godly line of Seth and the ungodly line of Cain. View number three. The sons of God is a title for rulers. And the daughters of man are women. Just very generically, they are women. In additional ancient Near Eastern literature the term sons of God is used to describe rulers. And there are selective sections, I think it's like, I think it's mostly the book of Daniel, where the term Elohim, which is normally used to translate as God, a generic term for God, is translated as ruler. The big issue, then, the sin that is going on here, is that there are rulers, authorities, kings, something, at this time, during the days of Noah, who, when you translate the took part, took the daughters of man as their wives, you can translate that word took or take, whatever, to mean took all of, is kind of the expansion of the Hebrew there. All that to say, the sin going on here is polygamy, that there were kings who took as many wives as they want during the days of Noah. And again, polygamy is not advised in Scripture. Jacob, yes, Jacob, in a couple chapters from now, is going to have two wives. Solomon has multiple wives. David has multiple wives. But the multiple wives are never shown in positive light. Having a polygamous relationship in scripture is never shown positively. There's always major issues that come from that. Marriage is hard in general. Let's just get that out of the way. But God's design for marriage is one man and one woman, not multiple men and multiple women in one relationship. So, view one, demons had sex with humans. View two, the line of Seth and the line of Cain are intermingling. View three, kings are taking as many wives as they want. The problem with this view is that never in the scriptures is the term sons of God used for rulers, like that literal phrase. You may have some instances where the word Elohim is translated as ruler for context, but there is never an equation of kings are the same as God, or kings are the direct children of God. That would be the problem. Those are the main three scholarly views. There are two additional ones that I came across with. The first one is that the sons of God are just men, and the daughters of man are just women. And the sin here, again, is polygamy. Sons of God, when you go back to Adam, Adam was born directly of God. Eve was born from out of Adam, from his rib. And so these are just titles being used here to describe men and women, and they're intermingling, and there is, from them, a race of warriors. That's kind of the thing also, is that in this first view, 
you have like a superhuman race. All the rest of these, what you get is a tribe of warriors. This term, Nephilim, this term of mighty men comes back up in the book of Numbers and it describes giants. Like Goliath later on would probably have been like a descendant from these groups of people of warriors. So the problem though with this fourth view and why it's easily dismissed is that there is an interesting contextual thing going on here. Because remember, in verse 1, it says that, let me get back over here and read this, it says that when man began to multiply on the face of the land. So it says right up front, man is multiplying. But then in verse 2, it says, the sons of God. And then it comes back up again, the sons of God. So, this is actually something that one of my uh, classmates brought up in their discussion, in their uh, position paper, that it kind of leans itself to the idea that there is two different things going on here. If Moses, being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this, was just going to say men and women were having children together, he would have just wrote, and men started taking as many wives as they wanted. Why are we why did we switch from verse 1 saying humanity got wicked and then in verse 2 the sons of God? What would be the point of switching if we've already established this? Just say men and women. So that's the problem with number 4. Number 5 is all of them put together. <laughs> Which is a shame that this one isn't the readily one of the more readily accepted scholarly views because I think this would probably be the place that I would land that essentially rulers are being possessed by demons to take as for themselves as many wives as they can to try and fulfill their sexual desires and the result is a slightly superhuman race of warriors Yep, came across that one only in one spot, not one of the more readily accepted views, even though it kind of tries to tie all the threads together. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes those views are the ones that we should probably start leaning more towards, is the ones where everything is kind of brought together in the middle. But I was told to talk about which one of the three main ones I was leaning towards. And that was the interesting part about the homework assignment this week. All the other weeks on these positional papers and forum posts I've had to write is present the subject, present what your view. Present the subject, present which one which one of the views you are leaning or that you are believing in. In this one it was it was semantics worded very carefully. Which one of explain the views and which one are you leaning towards? And this is an important point, folks. I want you to walk away from this episode, even though we've been going for like 20, almost 25 minutes on this right now. Here's the thing. No one knows. I'm reading some of the most scholarly guys that you can read on the subject of on this subject. And no one really knows. And you know what? In this specific case, that's okay. There's not really anything on the redemption of humanity in this passage. So it's okay. It's okay if you don't know. It's okay to say it could be this, it could be that in this specific passage. And anyone who tells you that it is this view, they are either trying to sound very intelligent or they are trying to provide you a false sense of security with this text. If you want security in the text, go to plenty of other passages. There's plenty of other places in scripture where you can go and say, thus saith the Lord, this is what it says. But with this one, just, it's okay to let it kind of dangle. It's okay. It can just kind of hang out there. So again, back to our original three positions. Demons had sex with humans. The, set, the line of Seth and Cain are intermingling. Rulers are taking as many wives as they want. 
For me, I think it comes down to one of the first two views. This line, this thing about the kings taking as many wives as possible, that just, there's not enough scriptural support for that. The other two actually have scriptural support for that. And the first one has a lot of historical support for it as well. Here's what I would have to say if I was to, like, really try to pick a view here. Everyone likes to bring up this Matthew twenty two thirty passage for where we're not going to be like the angel, or we're going to be like the angels who aren't given into marriage. The thing is, though, Jesus is talking about angels in Matthew 22. Here in Genesis 6, we're talking about fallen angels. We're talking about angels who are walking outside of God's intended design. Why would God design them to have a reproduction system if they weren't going to be put into marriage? I don't know. But it is plausible. I will lean on that. It is plausible that as fallen creatures following their own passions, they either did the deed themselves or possessed others to fulfill that desire in their life. So I think I actually do lean a little bit more towards the demons having sex with humans group. However, not going to die on a hill on that. And I think there are plenty of... I think there is good scriptural support for the Seth view as well. But like I have said week after week after week as we are discussing these highly debated topics and all of this is that I don't want us to get lost in all of the hubbub. I don't want us to get lost in all of the debating. I love this one. I don't know why. I think it's because it's so weird that I really enjoy nerding out on this one. But here's the thing. No matter what view you settle on, one of those five views, the common thread throughout all of them is sexual immorality. That is the issue. If we take anything from, the, from this discussion today, is that the issue here is there is sexual immorality going on, either interspecies or polygamy or intermingling of believers and non-believers, and that God has called us to a specific sexual ethic in Scripture. And I know, my progressive brothers and sisters in Christ, you may not like that. I understand. I know that that is a big part of the progressive, uh, more liberal side of Christianity, is turning away from some of these sexual purity things that the church has been teaching throughout the years. And to be fair, there are plenty of examples of times when the church has failed or has idolized teaching on sexual purity. However, it's still in the Bible. There is still teachings. There is still a way that God has called us to live out our sexuality that brings him glory and honor. And that's where I want to land on this for this episode. The weirdest episode, I would say, to date, talking about the sons of God and me encouraging everybody to embrace the teachings of sexuality in Scripture. Not necessarily what I thought I was going to be talking about on a Saturday morning while I'm still in my pajamas, but hey, we're all here now. We survived the episode. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, then please take a moment to rate and review the show on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on right now. Or head on over to the My Seminary Life Facebook page where you can write a recommendation on there as well. You can also follow us on Instagram at My Seminary Life Pod for other fun updates throughout the week. And more than the recommendation, I would really appreciate it if you told someone you knew about the show. Word of mouth is the best way to advertise for this show. And finally, you can follow me, Brandon Knight, on Instagram and TikTok at just.brandon.k for other fun faith-based content. So that's it for today's episode. 
Thanks for tuning in. I'm Brandon Knight. Keep on studying.